We're in Daniel 10. We're in a series that we've entitled Control in Chaos. How many of you would agree that life can be chaos? So how many of you have never driven on Highway 98? Oh, okay. Life is chaos, whether you agree or not. Sorry, it is. Because of Genesis chapter 3. Not because of orange cones. Because of Genesis chapter 3. That's why it's chaos. And listen, chaos is coming for you every single day. In the form of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The world system and the enemy who hates you. It's coming for you every day. The question is, how will you fight? In what realm? What realm are you most skilled? Physically? Emotionally? Relationally? Mentally? Financially? Legally? Familially? Where are you most skilled? Because this is a spiritual battle. All those other things ain't going to help you. You have a spiritual enemy who is alive. I don't know that he's well, but he's alive and he's coming for you. And sport's not going to save you. Neither is salary. Neither is you pursuing a situation where the dust settles. But if you'll learn how to use this, that's what Chuck Smith said. He said, the battle between the spirit and the flesh is waged on the warfare of the mind. So what do we need to help the mind? We need God's word. How does a young person keep their way clean? The psalmist would write, Psalm 119. Does anyone know? By taking heed according to God's word. How can one take heed to something that he or she does not know? They cannot. So if I were an enemy, I would get it out of my scholastic requirements for the young children. If I were the enemy, I would seek to debunk it and turn it from faith to fantasy. If I were the enemy, I would get you to believe that there's this dichotomy of the Jesus of faith and the Jesus of history. Have any of you ever taken a higher textual criticism class in a secular institution? I have. You know how intentional they are about ensuring that they embarrass you, that you don't know what you're talking about? You live in a world that has a system that is not necessarily your friend. And are you even aware of it? How are you fighting? Physically? Emotionally, scholastically, relationally, financially, what will those do in the spiritual realm? Those are your tools. Those are your tactics. Those are your weapons. Those won't help you. You need to know the spirit of God. And the word of God will correct and confirm that which spirit you determine to be either God's spirit or another spirit. The word of God is your filter, is your formation, is your friend. I would encourage you highly to get to know this book. I think it would be awesome if there was a church that cared so deeply for you that every single weekday they produced a video to take you through God's word so that you could learn it and live it well. Wouldn't, I would go to a church like that, would you? Well, you do. That's the thing. To be daily in God's word is such a gift. Now, in Daniel chapter 10 today, uh, there are teaching notes available for those that are inclined. I don't know that we'll actually look at all these teaching notes, but they're there for you if you should so choose to use them. But we seek to live self-controlled. Why? Because we know and trust that God is what, church? He is... So why should we live self-controlled? Because we know God. And who's God? He's the one who is in. Don't worry. Be happy. Why? Because I know him. He's in control. I can choose to stay self-controlled because he's in control. Now, what God is revealing to Daniel in Daniel chapter 7 through 12, 
through four different visions is chaos. Chaos that will ensue upon the world and his people, the Jews specifically. But through it all, God's in control. This morning, we're going to be in Daniel chapter what? Do you remember? Chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10 is the prologue. Daniel chapter 11 is the episode. And Daniel chapter 12 is the epilogue. We're almost done. Today is the prologue of a vision in chapter 11 of conflicts for the nation of Israel. That's what next week will be. And Daniel, today we're going to see, gains tremendous insight into the spiritual realm. The cosmic battle that's all around us. And the reality that life is not your playground based on your truth. There is an enemy and he's coming for you every day. Life is more of a battleground than it is a playground. You know, I remember this years ago. I had some of these old uh, boxing gloves and like, I don't know what is Muay Thai. Is that something that they say? It was like a headgear. It said tie on it. Like it had covered your cheekbones, covered your chin, covered your head bone, if that's the thing. Covered everything. So if you got hit, it didn't hurt as bad. It still hurt, but not, not as bad. And I, at that season in my life, had three young daughters and one young son. <laughs> and I remember we had all this boxing gear out in our living room. We lived in Destin at the time. And uh, the girls would put it on, I guess kind of like a princess crown. Didn't really look that good. But like, you know, they're playing with it. And uh, I, put my bo- I put the boxing gear on and I pretended like I was coming for the girls. This was so funny. I was coming for the girls. It this was really a funny thing. I was coming for the girls and they started to cower. And you know what my little Uliam Lee Neal did? Liam? He was probably two, three. He went like this. Rawr! He growled at me. Like as I was coming for him, he like, Rawr! like he was like, I'm, I'm ready, dad. <laughs> I was like, wow, this is awesome. Like Liam at age two, he was ready for the fight. Like he saw someone bigger, definitely fatter coming for him. And, and the girls ran and Liam, I'll, I'm going to, I'm taking this guy. I love that memory. Uh, it was, it was such an awesome moment in my life. And in the same way, this is what I would say. There's an enemy coming for you, and he's in better shape than I am. However, what will you do? Flight, fight, freeze, or fawn? Like, what will you do? What can you do? Well, I think we should allow our warrior king to growl, so to speak. Does that make sense? The lion of the tribe of Judah? Let him fight that battle. We don't engage with the enemy. Jesus does. Jesus does. And here's my hope this morning. I'm going to give you four takeaway truths. Do you remember how many? Four takeaway truths that I hope will be helpful to you today that come from Daniel chapter 10, that if you should so choose to engage with them, they will be tools in your tool belt to help you learn How to stay self-controlled in the midst of chaos. They come from Daniel chapter 10. I'd like to read the first three verses to get us in context. I'll be reading and teaching from the New Living Translation, but here's how it reads. In the third year of the reign of King Cyrus of Persia, Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, had another vision. And he understood that the vision concerned events Listen to what it says. Certain to happen in future. Times of war and great hardship. When this vision came to me, I, Daniel, had been in mourning for three whole weeks. And at that time, had eaten no rich food, no meat or wine crossed my lips. And listen to the aroma that would have been happening. And I used no fragrant lotions until those three weeks had passed. This is an interesting scenario. Here's one of the first things we see about Daniel just by reading these three verses. Daniel's not in a good spot. 
Like if people would have said, hey, I haven't seen Danny for a couple weeks. How's he doing? Hey, I hear he's not bathing. Like he's not really eating that much. He's kind of losing his mind. He's saying he's having visions of things that are certainly going to happen. And they're about, they kind of sound like Lord of the Rings. I mean, they wouldn't have known that at that point. But you know what, like the eye, like it sounds like death and destruction. Like this is what's going on with Daniel. Daniel, well, he was great in his younger years, but in his later years, look what's happening to him. He's lamenting, he's crying, he's depressed for three weeks. Three weeks. Why is this happening? Well, look at what verse one says. It's the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia. That's important. Context is very important for the text that's before you. See, the Jews had been back in Jerusalem for two years. That's what Daniel saw, and that's what he had been praying for. Ezra chapter 1 tells us that it was in the first year of Cyrus that the Jewish people returned from Babylon to Jerusalem. So now two years have passed, but only a small portion of the Jews actually went back to Jerusalem. Ezra chapter 2 actually gives us the exact number. It's just under 50,000 people. That, that's a drop in the bucket compared to how many stayed in Babylon. So why is Daniel in this funk? Why is he not doing well? Let me give you at least two reasons. Number one, the people that he cared greatly for, they had grown comfortable in Babylon. They raised their kids there. They made some money there. They started to play sports there. They, they lived there. Babylon became home. And this is sad for Daniel. Second reason, they weren't necessarily successful. What do you mean? They weren't able in two years to establish the monarchy again. When they got back, it took them seven months just to clear the rubble from the temple grounds. And their enemies were constantly attacking and the work was constantly being stopped. See, Daniel had been praying, had been dreaming about them going back to their homeland. But only a few went. And those that went, they weren't that successful. And the work had come to a halt. So what's he doing? He's mourning. He's fasting. And as we continue to read this chapter, we'll see something that he does that he's very accustomed to doing, praying. And, and I think this is a great principle to learn from. I shared with you that I would share four takeaway truths. Here's the first one. You could probably buy this at Hobby Lobby and put it on your wall. When life gets too hard to stand, kneel. Have you seen that at Hobby Lobby? They have it on plaques. You say, what do you mean by that? One of the biggest lessons that you should and I can and we are able to learn about hardship and difficulty and things kind of going like this with your plan is to pray. I'm going to tell you something. Life is not all roses and rainbows. It's hard. Sin is a part of this world. People die. Marriages end before they could or should. People live with ghosts everywhere where the relationship is dead, but the person is still breathing. Potential dies. You see it in your child. Oh, they have this potential to, to be this or to be that. But listen to me. Potential has an expiration date. Just because you have potential doesn't mean it'll be actualized. There is loss in this life. There is pain. There is suffering. There are unmet expectations that we all have. And what happens when we feel like everything is out of control and everything perceives to be chaos and God is silent? What do you do? This is what John Bunyan said. We can do more than pray. But we cannot do more than prayer until we've prayed. Spurgeon said, prayer moves the hand that moves the world. You have not because you ask not. Let's see what happens next. Look at verse 4. 
On April 23rd, I was standing on the bank of the great river Tigris. I looked up and saw a man dressed in linen clothing with a belt of gold around his waist. His body, it looked like a precious gem. His face flashed like lightning and his eyes flamed like the torches and his arms and feet shone like polished bronze and his voice, his voice roared like a vast multitude of people. This is a powerful sight to behold. So what happens to Daniel? Keep reading. Look at verse 7. Only I, Daniel, saw this vision. He's with other guys. It says the men with me saw nothing. But they were suddenly terrified. They ran away to hide. So I was there, left all alone to see this amazing vision. And my strength left me. My face grew deathly pale. I felt very weak. Then I heard the man speak. And when I heard the sound of his voice, I fainted and lay there with my face to the ground. Now remember, Daniel, he's not 93 like Marge, but he's 86. And a culture that probably didn't have air conditioning. Probably did not have DoorDash, you know, different world. He's 86 years old. He's been in Babylon, Babylonian captivity since he was 15. Prisoner of war, so to speak. He's seen a lifetime worth of dreams and visions. He's interpreted other people's dreams. He's survived administration after administration. He survived the lion's den. Listen, he's no spring chicken. He's older but would you say, Daniel, uh, look, you know, when they're talking, that, that wimpy guy, he can't endure. Daniel, the guy that like was in the lion's den, that started like here, and then he was like number two in the world, wimpy Daniel? No, 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 no. But this luminescent being stands in front of him, and what happens to Daniel? He collapses. Everyone around him bails. Now, what's going on here? Who, 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 who is this? This luminescent being. In the teaching notes, if you're interested, there is a reference to who quite possibly this could be. And you are more than welcome to dive into that and disagree with me, and I'll show you where you're wrong. And that's what we'll do. But like, no. But for those that are interested, dig in deeper. Who is this? This luminescent being. But let me ask a question that I think is more fitting for why we're here this morning. Why does he see this? What's happening here? Daniel is about to be told about the future battles. It's going to be in chapter 11 that Israel is going to face in the near and distant future. It's going to be told about Greece and Persia and Antiochus Epiphanes and Alexander and so on. But God shows him another battle taking place in the heavenlies. God wants Daniel to know who's really in control. The spiritual battle you and I face, here's the deal. The better you know who's in control, who your commanding officer is, well, the more resolve you'll have, the more faith. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that we should be looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. You see, here's the problem. I'm going to give you a second tool. If the first tool or the first takeaway or the first key is simply that when things get too hard to stand, we should kneel, here's the second thing. When we go through difficulty or attack from the enemy, we have a tendency to gaze at our problems and to glance at our Bibles. Does that make sense? The tendency in the natural is to engineer or exit a problem. Okay, I'm in a problem. I got to get into engineer mode. How do I fix it? Or I got to get out of here. I got to exit. The spiritual, before I engineer, engineering's not bad. Before I create an exit plan, that's not bad. I'm going to engage. First and foremost, I will engage with God. God, help. God, let me see you. God, let me focus upon you. This is the difference between spiritual leadership and books on business leadership. You will learn how to engineer, how to exit, how to execute. Not bad things. Good things to learn. But what does it look like to be a spiritual leader? 
yeah, engineer, exit, all those E's we could come up with, I'm sure. But before that, I engage. You know what I've learned about life? What you know is important. It is. But who you know can change things for you. You know how I know that? Because when I get to heaven, it's not going to be about what I know. It's about who I know. Hey, that guy says I can come in. That guy right there, his name's Jesus. He said I could come in. So deal with it. Jesus said I'm, I'm good to come in. And I've seen that in my life and in the life of others. How did this work out for you? How did this situation? I knew so-and-so. Well, well, there you go. That's how it worked out. Life often is more about who you know than what you know. But see, if you stepped into church this morning going like this, I wonder if anyone will greet me at the door. I wonder if anyone, anyone will see that I'm sitting here by myself. You've already stepped into a platform of failure. Say, so what do you mean? If you want a friend, you must be a friend. If you're looking to find a friend, you'll never find one. You'll just keep looking and waiting for a friend to show up. That's not how you find friends. The way you find friends is to stick your hand out and go, hello, my name is not your friend. May I become your friend? That's how you have a friend. See, if you step into a youth group, a children's ministry, an adult education situation, a business, a community, and go, will they notice? How come? Why aren't they pursuing me? You will always, 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 always be in the area of your life in that realm where you're seeking to kick rocks into the Grand Canyon to fulfill your relational whole. It's never going to happen. But if you'll say, hello, my name is, hello, my name is, you'll start to make friends. That's how they're made. If you look for a friend, you may never find one, but if you look to be a friend, you may find friends. And here's the dynamic. Daniel here, he knows God. So what does he do? He prays. You see, we have a tendency to gaze at our problems and only glance at the Lord. We gaze at the problem. God, this is tough. This is horrible. This is bad. I got to talk to people about it. Bad, 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 bad. Gaze, 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 gaze. I'm looking at the problem. Lord, let me shoot up a bubble of prayer. Okay, problem, problem, problem. Lord, where's the bubble? Okay. We need to reverse that and glance at our problems and gaze at the Lord. Listen, I'm all about process. Trust me. If I engage a problem or a pitch, I have a seven alliterated approach to approach that to eventually either pull the trigger or pull out or hit pause for more information. I know about processing. I'm not anti-processing. But I also know that I'm not led by analytics in life. I'm led by faith. But it is a reasonable faith. But it is not analytics that drives my decisions. It's faith. Because we walk by faith and not by sight. Does that mean we don't pay attention to sight? No, we do. But it is not our determinant factor. Faith is. You want to live self-controlled in the midst of chaos? Here's how you do it. Glance at your problems and gaze at your God. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. A generation past knew this. Well, let's see what happens with Daniel. Verse 10 says, just then a hand touched me and lifted me and still trembling to my knees, my hands. The man said to me, Daniel, listen to what he says. Listen to what he says. Please don't miss this. Daniel, you are very precious to God. So listen carefully to what I say to you. Stand up, for I have been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. I don't want you to miss this. There's more in the notes that you can reference here if you should so choose to. But did you catch the tone of what was said here? Daniel, you're very precious to God. Go ahead and stand up. I've got some things I want to share with you. How do you hear the voice of God? 
Is Genesis chapter 3 read by you when God learns about, or we, we get the perception and vantage points that he learns about, even though he already knew, that Adam and Eve sinned? Is this your way that you think of God's voice? Daniel! Adam! Where are you? Is that who you think God is? Or do you think that God the Father said, Adam, where are you? Daniel, you're very precious to me. See, you may not be able to help that. Because when you hear the word Father, you may have a broken image of what that means. I'm just like you. CBS. I was conceived. Anyone else here ever been conceived? I was born. Anyone else here been born? And I was shaped. So were you. You were shaped by the family you were born into, the cultural around you, and the stories that you believed. You're being sold stories every single day. You may not have a great filter to determine truth from error with those stories if you don't know the Bible. But see, your image of dad or father will shape the way you hear the Bible. Why do you think God is so intentional about healthy marriages and relationships? Why do you think that Hitler knew if I reach the men, I can change this world? Because if you know what a good dad looks like, that's supposed to be an image of God. But for many of us, the way we interpret father is like this. Daniel, Adam, and listen to me. Please hear me on this. I'm sorry that you went through that. But you have a heavenly father who loves you, who cares for you. And please hear this truth. If you're ever under pressure, you need to remember that you're precious to God. Don't you see what's happening to Daniel? The dude is not bathing. He stinketh, as the King James would say. He's not eating. He's, he's like Howard Hughesing his life. Does that make sense? Like he's, his fingernails are growing out. He's got mason jars up there. Like... He's, he's freaking out. And now this being comes into his room. And this is Daniel. This is the tip of the spear. This isn't some newbie. He's freaked out. He's under pressure. And when you're under pressure, you need to remember that you're precious to God. God is not against you. How do I know that, Neil? Look behind me. Look to the left and right of me. The cross of Jesus Christ settles this truth. God loves you. That question is not up for discussion. It is a statement. God so loved you that he gave his son in exchange for you. Jesus died the death that you deserve so that you could live his life, which you don't deserve. You're precious to God. When you're under pressure, how do I stay controlled under pressure in chaos? All things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. What is that, a bumper sticker? No, that's Bible. But if you don't know Bible, bro, you're going to be chaos. The Bible is your friend. Get to know it. You see... James, the half-brother of Jesus, put it this way. When troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Doesn't that sound like the natural way to do it? All right, Highway 98, great joy. This is my opportunity. Here we go. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Daniel, you're precious. Now let's see what happens. Let's pick up in verse 12 and read all the way to 21. If you're still there, let me know by saying, I'm precious to God. Okay, here we go. Verse 12. This is going to be gnarly for you. Lots of verses. Here we go. Then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for the understanding and to humble yourself before God, your request, it was heard in heaven from the very first time. 
I have come in answer to your prayer, but for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Cyrus? No, the spirit prince. Oh, and then Michael, one of the archangels, he came to help me. And I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. So now I'm here with you to explain what will happen to your people in the future. For this vision concerns a time yet to come. Are you picking up what's, what they're laying down? There's a spiritual battle you don't know anything about, Daniel. Verse 15. While he was speaking to me, <laughs> I looked down at the ground, unable to say a word. And then the one who looked like a man touched my lips and he opened my mouth and, and began to speak. And I said to the one standing in front of me, I am filled with anguish because of the vision I have seen. My Lord, I am very weak. How can someone like me, your servant, talk to you, my Lord? My strength is gone. I can hardly breathe. And then one who looked like a man touched me again, and I felt my strength returning. Don't be afraid, he said, for you are very precious to God. Peace. Be encouraged. Be strong. As he spoke these words to me, I suddenly felt stronger, and I said to him, Please, speak to me, my Lord, for you have strengthened me. And he replied, Do you know why I have come? Soon I must return to fight against the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia, and after that the spirit prince of the kingdom of Greece will come. Meanwhile, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one helps me against these spirit princes except Michael, your spirit prince. Wow. That's gnarly. Daniel is given insight into the spiritual world and what's going on around him of an invisible war. Now, there, you ever heard of the Gallup organization? They take polls. Anyone ever heard of Gallup? A couple of you? Okay. There's a poll of American people that they put out, the Gallup organization, that most people believe in God, but fewer people actually believe in a devil. I've heard someone say, well, that's convenient. Let's believe in heaven, not hell, right? Like the Gallup poll showed that those who believe there's a devil, 50% say that he's a personal being like the Bible teaches. The other 50% think the devil is just a word for an impersonal evil force in the world. Oh, the devil of traffic. Oh, the devil of lactose intolerant. Or like whatever the devil is, you know, like, like okay. So one in two think, I don't believe the Bible. Now, not you guys. Like you got up, you came to a 9 a.m. church service on a Sunday morning in May when it's beautiful out and it's been a rainy weekend. There are probably more than like 50% of us that believe the devil is a real being like the Bible says in this room. But I would bet at least one person in here goes, that's crazy. Okay. Dr. John White said this. Have no delusions about the reality of demons and their hostility. They will also oppose you as you obey Christ. If you play it cool and decide not to be a fanatic about Christianity, you will have no trouble with them. But if you're serious about Christ being your Lord and God, you can expect opposition. If you go, man, I never experience opposition. It's probably because you're going the same way as the devil. Why has he got to mess with you? You're doing nothing. You're just a pawn. Thinking that it's your truth. When really you're deceived. You know what I heard? from Mark Twain, from a friend this week. I'm going to butcher this quote because I didn't write it down. But Mark Twain said something to the effect of this. It's easier to fool a man than to help a man see that he's been fooled. You're deceived. No, I'm not. How can you know you're in darkness until you see the light? The enemy has been deceiving for generations, generations. And the enemy knows this book way better than you or I. He knows how to twist it. You see, the way to make a lie palatable is a spoonful of sugar helps the lie go down. Does that make sense? It's sweet, but also there's some truth to it. No one would believe an outright lie. Maybe some person would. But if you twist the truth, and if I can get you just one degree off, you know this airline pilots, right? You go one degree off, what happens to your destination? You never see it. You're way off. One degree off over time means you're way off, but not at first. And that's how deception works. You remember Casting Crowns? You know that band? It's a slow fade. That's how he gets you. That's how he gets you. He gets you with good things, and you turn them into God things thinking that, that they will produce, which they can never, ever, ever, ever produce. 
See, an idol always promises what it can never produce. And idols are not necessarily bad things in life. Sometimes they're good things. Salary, status, sex, substance, sports, situation, and stuff. All those things in their proper context and boundaries and rhythms bring an element of gratification. You make them God, they will destroy you. They will destroy you. When you take a good thing and make it a God thing, it robs the good thing of the thing that God intended it for. And thus it becomes an odd thing in your life. We call those idols. And idols can never, ever, 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 ever bring satisfaction. They'll only for a moment bring gratification, but then they're hooks. And they've got you. So enjoy everything that God brings into your life that's good for you within the boundaries of God's word. I know that's not a popular opinion. But here's what I find interesting. For three weeks, Daniel had been praying. And what does it say in verse 21? For 21 days, well, verse 13. For 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom blocked my way, this angel said. There is a spiritual battle. But here's this fourth tool I want to share with you, and then we're going to close. The word of God keeps you from deception, and prayer can keep you from destruction. We find Daniel on his knees in this chapter, praying. Prayer is like bringing a gun to a knife fight. Does that make sense? Because you're cooperating with God. We don't want to fall into a fatalistic, weak sauce, diminished view of prayer. Well, there's nothing else I can do, so I guess we'll pray. Oh. Well, at least you're praying, I guess. Pray first. You see, the angel made it clear that the battle wasn't over. As soon as he finished talking with Daniel, he's going back to the fight. There were satanic agents who were opposing the plans of God. And let me share with you in closing what Warren Wiersbe says about this. He says this. The ruler of Persia had shown great kindness and mercy to the Jews in allowing them to return home. And Satan was against this decision. God had also plans for Greece, and Satan wanted to interfere there. One reason why God commands his people to pray for those in authority is so that God's will, not Satan's plans, might be fulfilled in their lives. The destiny of more than one nation has been changed because God's people have fervently prayed. You see, you may not be able to one day take a ball and put it through a round hoop with a net and make millions of dollars and have your name be called LeBron. That may not be you. Right? You may not be skilled in such a way where athletically you're going to just be awesome. That may not be you. You may not be able to be like Billy Joel, who writes some songs. You may not be that guy. You know, you may not be able to be that successful with music or with sport. But let me share something with you. You can learn to pray with the best of them. And at the end of the day, you've brought a gun to a fist fight. And at the end of the day, when the real awards matter, that's called the Bema Seat of Christ. Maybe you don't know about this, that there's two judgments that are coming for you. The great white throne, which if you're a Christian, you ain't got to worry about that one. Jesus already took your place. But there's another one coming for you called the Bema Seat Judgment. So what's that? It's an award ceremony. Don't worry. You're not going to get beat up. You're not going to be judged. You're not like that kind of situation. But there is an award ceremony, like on, what was it, Thursday, I stood on this stage, and there were like 34-year-olds and 5-year-olds, they all got awards. You're the next president award. Wow, that's pretty cool, we met the president. You're the hardest worker award. You're like the next doctor award. They all got these awards that recognize their potential. Now, will that potential be actualized? Who knows? Will their plans change? Most definitely, you know? My son wants to be a paleontologist. I'm amazed that he knows that name. And he may become one. Leo loves dinosaurs. He might become the best paleontologist the world has ever seen. I don't know. Maybe so. I can't wait to see what he does. It's an exciting journey to discover who your kids are, not force them to become what you want them to be. But what would it look like to say, I want to excel in life. And I'm going to focus on the spiritual. Not just the physical. Not just the emotional. Not just the relational, not just the mental, not just the academic or athletic. 
or apprenticeship. I'm going to focus on the spiritual. Here's what I would say as someone who has invested 23 years in spiritual disciplines. They're worth it. They're more used to you than a great portfolio. They return on their investment better than anything else. And where are you? Where are you? What are you investing in? Did you know that this kind of fight is going on all the time? And you're trying to fight it with money? With your career? With your good looks and great attitude? That's not going to take you nowhere, man. Not spiritually. Let the Lord fight your battles. Get to know him. Get to know his word. Avoid the pitfalls of life that the word of God would show you that, no, this isn't the way. No, this is the way. Oh, this is how you love people. This is how you treat them. Wouldn't it be amazing if there was a church that every single day attempted to help you learn God's word? I feel like that's the best thing we can give you. Man, get to know Jesus. Get to know Jesus. Get to know Jesus. Follow us only as we follow Christ. That's how you should follow your leaders. Like, yeah, they're leaders, but do you, have you ever met them? Have you ever had a burrito with that guy? Like, that's awesome, but they're not perfect. I didn't know that. Don't, don't deify your leaders and don't demonize your leaders. See them as a dude or a dudette, right? That's a person that's leading. But I'm not going to deify them. They're not God. And I'm not going to demonize them either. They're flawed and odd. But I can give them a nod of respect because they're created in the image of God. And we can do that with everyone, right? So Daniel chapter 10. Here's these four takeaway truths. I don't know if we're going to have them on the screen or not. I forgot, I forgot if we're doing this or not. Maybe not. But the first one is, when life gets too hard to stand, what do we do? We kneel. Yeah, that's right. Instead of um, gazing at our problems and glancing at the Lord, we should glance at our problems and gaze upon the Lord. Right. When you're under pressure, you should remember that you are precious to God. Man, that's going to be attacked. You're going to see, why do bad things happen to, oh wait, there are no good people. But why do bad things happen? Theodicy is what that's called in the world of philosophy and theology. You need to remember that you're precious. And then number four, the word will keep you from deception and prayer will keep you from destruction. So you can live self-controlled because you know God. And you know who God is? God is the one who what? Is in control. Let's stand together.